Real estate debt has continued to grow in prominence for institutional investors who've been attracted to the healthy yields on offer, as well as the senior position in the capital stack. But as we all know, commercial real estate remains rife with risks and uncertainty, including the future path of interest rates, current valuations and transaction volumes, and broader macro and geopolitical risks. What are you going to be keeping an eye on uh, as we move forward here? I think I'd say that despite all the risks and uncertainties that are out there, this is still probably one of the best times to be deploying capital and real estate that, that I've seen in my entire career. And that's spanning over 25 years. And you can probably go back another decade or so before you saw something as attractive as today. That was Nasir Alamgir, head of U.S. real estate debt investments at Barings. And this is Streaming Income, a podcast from Barings. I'm your host, Greg Campion. Coming up on today's show, U.S. real estate debt. Why now? Before we get into the conversation, if you are not already following us and you are interested in hearing our views on asset classes ranging from high yield to private credit to real estate debt and equity, you can follow us by searching Streaming Income on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. With that, here is my conversation with Nasir Alamgir. All right, Nasir, welcome back to the podcast. Greg, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Excited to have you back. Uh, so it's been almost a year, I want to say, since you were last on the podcast. And uh, a lot's changed over that uh, time frame. So obviously, we're in a little bit of a different interest rate environment. We've seen, you know, we've got another year under our belt in terms of developments in the real estate market and everything that commercial real estate uh, is kind of working through. Um, but maybe let's start there. Like if you just look high level um, at the real estate debt landscape in particular, over the last year, kind of what are some of the biggest developments that you've seen? Well, I think it was interesting. I was going back and going through some of my notes from our last conversation, and I recalled mentioning that one of the things that we're keeping an eye on was bank exposure to commercial mortgage loans. Mm -hmm. uh, their balance sheets had grown by about $500 billion in 2022 alone, increasing by about 20%. Um, and we thought that there was going to be a really significant pullback in terms of their origination mm. in 2023. I think the one thing that we didn't anticipate is a month later, there is going to be a liquidity crunch, mm -hmm. a run on banks, and you had a number of banks fail. Yeah, uh, happened a lot exactly. quicker than maybe expected. But. So Silicon Valley Bank, Signature, et cetera. And I think those, those events um, took us a little bit by surprise. But again, we did think that it was going to be consistent thematically with what was going to be happening in 2023, which is a retrenchment from most lenders in the marketplace, mm -hmm. uh, mostly dealing with existing problems on their books, dealing with maturity walls, um, and trying to really find opportunities to put money to work, which was hard to do because transaction volume continued to be uh, a challenge mm -hmm. in 2023. Uh, we thought we found some really interesting opportunities, but overall, um, it was it was an interesting year, let's just say. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, a lot of the stuff you mentioned there I want to follow up on, including the retrenchment of the banks and uh, transaction volumes. But maybe before we get into those, let's hit interest rates. I mean, I feel like every podcast we do these days, there's a big question around, okay, um, we've kind of gotten to this point where it seems like maybe we're at peak rate. Maybe the Fed is sending us a message that the next move is lower. Um, but there's a lot of question marks around, you know, what is the pace of that look like, et cetera. So kind of broadly speaking, you look at where we are in the interest rate environment today. Um, tell me a little bit about the implications for uh, investors in real estate debt today. Well, and I'm going to juxtapose it a little bit to last year too, right? Last year, we expected rates to continue to go up. It was interesting. I was at a conference in January of last year. There was a lot of optimism. Um, there was another conference in January of this year. Mm. Now that's more cautious optimism. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure either of those are going to, didn't play out last year. I'm not sure it's going to play out this year. Okay. So I think the expectation for us is maybe we don't see rate hikes anymore, but we certainly see higher for longer. Mm -hmm. um, at least that's our view in real estate debt. And I think what that means is for those, uh, for those dealing with asset management concerns or issues with existing loans, 
you're going to be faced with certain outcomes. Those outcomes could be trying to extend your loans. Mm -hmm. We had about 500 billion of loans maturing last year in the commercial real estate space. Mm -hmm. A lot of those probably got kicked down, you know, that can, the proverbial can got kicked down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, we have 2.2 trillion maturing between now and the year end of 2027. So, Higher rates mean it's means it's going to be really difficult for borrowers to find alternative sources of capital to refi out those existing lenders, um, and it's going to continue to put pressure on valuations. Mm. So, with that backdrop, asset managing your portfolio is going to be a very hands-on endeavor, and it's going to take a considerable amount of people's time. But again, as a new lender or originator with fresh capital. Mm -hmm. I think 2024 is going to present as many opportunities as 2023 did, and probably a little bit more. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So a lot to work through there. But uh, yeah, to your point, if you're putting fresh capital to work, it could be a really interesting time to do so at this point. Now, um, a lot of these loans that you reference are, you know, historically, uh, for historical reasons, I guess, on, on bank balance sheets, right? So banks have historically been. Uh, the biggest lender to this space. And as you kind of mentioned up front, uh, you know, you were talking this time last year about bank retrenchment. We're seeing that now, right? So we're seeing, you know, much more stringent lending standards. We're seeing banks pull back for um, a variety of reasons. So tell me a little bit about that. It's almost, um, parts of it are almost reminiscent to me of this kind of major structural tailwind that we've seen in the direct lending space for a decade plus, where you've just seen this long-term trend of bank retrenchment. Um, and that's kind of driven a lot of opportunities for institutional asset managers, aka uh, lenders uh, like Bearings. But tell me just uh, how you're thinking broadly about that bank retrenchment trend, how far you think that's going to go and what you think some of the impacts will be. Yeah, look, I think that like private credit, I think it's a permanent retrenchment. Mm. So mm, the U.S. commercial real estate market is roughly $5 trillion. Banks make up about half of that. Um, last year, their origination volume was down 70%. The market overall was down 50%. Mm. Interestingly enough, the size of their balance sheets didn't shrink. It actually went up last mm. year despite that. Mm. So again, that's the proverbial can being kicked down sure. the road, right? Yep. Those loans weren't maturing and being repaid or, or refinanced. Um, so I think what's interesting is if you think that there's a permanent shift in the way banks will approach the market, that means that there will be a broader opportunity for that private lending base. So again, like we've seen in private credit, the private markets substituted that bank capital. Mm -hmm. We're seeing that not just in banks alone, we're seeing that in the securitization markets, we're seeing it in life insurance company production. So in general, private debt is going to have to step in to fill that void. Mm -hmm. Now, thinking uh, ahead to what this year uh, may offer, um, you know, I was uh, speaking with our head of US real estate research, Dag Chen, and he was telling me, in his view, he thinks this could be the year of a couple of things. One, it could be the year where we really start to see distress kind of hitting the market, so to speak. So you kind of reference this idea of kicking the can down the road and, you know, pushing out loans. But ultimately, um, you know, ultimately the, the bill comes due and that isn't possible or banks don't want to do that, et cetera. And so you start to see more distressed assets kind of hitting the market. So I'm kind of interested uh, what the implication of that could be. His other thought was though, while, while this could be the year of distress really kind of hitting, uh, it could also be the year where we start to see stabilization and even uh, a bit of recovery um, in the uh, commercial real estate market. So if he's right and those things are true and hopefully not mutually exclusive, curious around what you think for that means for things like transaction volumes um, and just broader ability to deploy debt capital. And you would think those two ideas are almost counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. But I think what Dags is saying is distressed activity will allow us to truly figure out where the bottom of valuations mm, are. Mm -hmm. And without those data points, which we really haven't had in any substantive way up to this point, 
it's hard to peg where the bottom yeah, is. Yeah. So once we are able to establish that, we can establish that baseline and then figure out where we go from there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I agree with him. I think distress is coming this year. And mm-hmm. most of the fact is, uh, some of that fact is attributable to lenders having taken write downs or impairments on their existing book, which will allow them to move that okay. paper this okay. year, which yep. where they weren't really able to do last year. Mm-hmm. I think that's across the board. Um, I think you've seen tighter underwriting standards. I think banks alone have reported six quarters of credit tightening mm-hmm. in terms of their lending parameters. Um, and their provisions have gone up mm-hmm. each and every quarter since that time. So all of those things mean that there's more capacity to absorb the pain that may be felt in mm-hmm. some of those loans. So yes, I, I agree. I think there's going to be, going to be more activity in the in Okay. The and and do you think that will be uh, exclusively centered in the office um, sector or do you think it's more broad based than that? It's more broad based than that, but that'll be the focal point, the center yeah. of transaction activity. I think one of the things that may be difficult to move with respect to moving office distressed paper, distressed office paper this year, uh, or even in the foreseeable future, is we don't really know what the true future of office ultimately is going to look like. Yeah. We can see what some of the existing trends are, mm-hmm. but does return to office or office utilization continue to improve mm-hmm. down the road? Mm-hmm. Do the properties that we consider commodity and obsolete today actually find some home? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, are there conversion opportunities? There are a lot of different questions that we need to have answered. There's so many Mm -hmm. that it's really hard to see all of that figuring itself out this year. Yeah. So, uh, so I might disagree with Dags in terms of like truly finding that opportunity in terms of setting that value for equity Mm -hmm. in 2024, but, but we're getting there. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. And when I had Joe Gorin, our head of us real estate equity on the podcast a couple months ago, I mean, I think his sentiment was similar, but he was he was also saying, you know, look, that that doesn't mean there's no opportunities in uh, office. They're just very highly select, very idiosyncratic, specific situations. And he talked about um, a deal that Barings did recently. I think it was near Newton, Massachusetts, um, that was kind of a refurbish. But it's it's you know a lot of these types of properties that are you know, hitting very specific trends in a highly educated area and, you know, in a, in a sector that, you know, needs to be in the office, like a life sciences, et cetera. So it seems like there are these opportunities emerging, at least uh, on the equity side that he was talking about, but it's very idiosyncratic. Would you agree with that? I do. I agree with that. So I think it's, um, you're, you're probably strategizing more today mm-hmm. in terms of what you want to do with equity mm-hmm. and debt you're trying to figure out how to put fresh capital to work. Mm, yeah, tell me a little bit more about that. I'm interested in this in this kind of relative value because I think obviously US real estate equity and real estate equity, I guess more broadly as well, is a much more developed institutional asset class. People have been used to investing in this for a long time, less so um, debt. And so um, how are you thinking just broadly about what that relative value picture and, and how do you and the team, I guess, think about relative value between the two? Yeah, we talk about relative value pretty frequently mm-hmm. and we have to do it across the risk spectrum and we have to do it across debt and equity and we have to do it across geographies. Mm-hmm. And I think what's really interesting is that probably geography plays a much more important part than I think people realize because you can have very different macroeconomic factors mm-hmm. that are going to influence the outcome of your investments, whether those are debt investments or equity investments. So I think one of the examples I like to use today is, well, if you look at an economy like China's, they're worrying about deflation. Mm. Right here in the US, we're worrying about inflation. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. those have very different impacts on the type of investment you wanna make, the duration of that investment and the risk profile you wanna consider. So for us today, again, I think with fresh capital, regardless of the bucket, we wanna put it to work in debt. Mm -hmm. Um, With future capital, we want to figure out where that opportunity might be in equity. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. Yeah, before we started recording, I was mentioning a conversation I had with Dags Chen, again, our head of U.S. real estate research, where he was sort of comparing the two and saying U.S. real estate equity is almost in its off season right now. And it's a time where you're kind of dusting off your your playbooks and doing your draft picks and things like that because you know there's a real opportunity coming. Uh, it, it's just, you know, when is that specific time. And uh, whereas in debt, it seems like that is much more apparent opportunity today as we sit here. 
Agreed. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's talk about within the real estate debt universe. I mean, we've kind of been high level so far. Uh, we touched on office a little bit, but tell me as you look across that kind of broad universe, uh, where are you seeing particular opportunities today? Any sectors that like really jump out at you that are particularly attractive today? Much like last year, we still think bridge lending like on like transitional properties is still some of the best risk adjusted returns that we see in the market today. Mm -hmm. um, I think interestingly enough, last year we probably talked about construction lending mm -hmm. as well. Yep. I think I'd like to think about the market in in three ways. There are parts of the market that are moving fairly smoothly but slowly. Mm -hmm. Then there are parts of the market, and I'm talking about the real estate debt market, that are pretty dysfunctional. And then there are parts of the market that are actually look up almost completely broken. Mm. And one of those spaces really is in construction lending. So we said, you know, banks have been retrenching on 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 lending for six quarters, but they've been retrenching on construction loans for seven. Mm. Right? The alternative sources for capital and construction lending are almost non-existent. So to the extent that you're a private source of capital and you can make a construction loan today, relative value is really, really amazing. Um, now, there are certainly things that we want to be cognizant of in delivering new supply in certain economic conditions, but um, that trade, if you want to call it one, that investment looks really attractive. Mm -hmm. From a property type perspective, it's 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 really hard to pick outside of your the safest asset classes, mm -hmm. whether it's multifamily, whether mm -hmm. it's industrial, self-storage is attractive, data centers continue to have their moment in the sun. Um, but like Joe said, you got to kind of find that needle in the haystack when it comes to the office deal. Mm -hmm. or you might have to find that needle in the haystack when it comes to maybe a retail loan. Yeah, yeah. Or investment. And, and on the construction lending, is there specific sectors on constructing construction lending that more, look more or less attractive? Is that like a multifamily or anything else that jumps out at you as being particularly attractive there? I, I certainly think that multifamily and industrial lending, I, I feel like it's just such an obvious answer. Mm. Great, go make a multifamily loan, whether it's construction or bridge, mm -hmm. go make a multi industrial loan, whether it's, it's construction or bridge. But I think you can actually still find really interesting opportunities outside of those asset classes. I think hospitality is one that's mm. really attractive. Okay, so I building hotels? Building hotels. Okay. And I think that we also see um, mixed use mm. being attractive. Mm -hmm. And that can include office as, as, a, as a use. Yeah. Because that new building that's highly amenitized near a transportation hub that has surrounding amenities either within or out immediately surrounding the property, is still an attractive asset class. So um, there are some unique opportunities outside of just your traditional ones. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, we're sitting here uh, recording this in Charlotte, North Carolina today, and we've got a surprising, to me, a surprising amount of skyscrapers still going up all over the place, even uh, in spite of the fact that some of the older, more out-of-date buildings have pretty darn high vacancy rates. Um, but also to your point out in the suburbs, there's a lot of development going on with like reinvention of 1990s industrial parks into much more modern, amenitized, uh, you know, multi-use um, properties with retail and restaurants and residential, et cetera. So um, it's interesting to see that. I feel like Charlotte's a pretty good case study of some of that actually on the ground today. Yeah, it's, it's evidence of the experiential economy or state of mind today mm -hmm. where people want to be able to do lots of different things within the, within the convenience radius mm -hmm. of where they live, where they work, where they play. Yeah, yeah. Any, any particular geographies or cities in the U.S. where you're like, we are really trying to put capital to work here today or is it, or is it more on a kind of idiosyncratic basis? I don't know if I want to give away all of our secret sauce <laughs> yeah, yeah, here, so yeah. I'm okay. going to try to be a little bit... Um, Look, I think there are a lot of unobvious hmm. places mm -hmm. that you can put money to work. Um, and what I mean by that is there are overlooked parts of the country uh, simply because it doesn't have international cachet or whatever it is, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but that are resilient mm. because people work, people live, people play in those areas and they're growing. And I think when we apply that 
research lens that DAGS puts on our investments and we're looking at educational attainment, um, population growth, job growth, wage growth, resilient industries. Mm -hmm. It isn't just markets in the Southeast that reflect those right. statistics. Right. And, and, and so we're, we're looking a little bit we're, we're looking a little bit beyond some of those obvious choices. All right, all right, folks, you heard it. You have to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation <laughs> with Nasir to get the uh, real secret sauce there. Uh, but yeah, clearly um, the, the the work of the, the research team uh, and all the structural trends uh, factors heavily into um, uh, sourcing and, um, and evaluating uh, different opportunities that your team um, comes across. So I'm glad you gave DAGS a shout out there. Um, okay, so, you you know, one of the interesting trends that we've seen uh, in recent years is institutional investors really increasing their allocation to real estate debt. And I mentioned earlier, it's kind of been maybe a little bit less developed. Music to my ears, by the way, so yeah. <laughs> um, maybe a little bit less developed. Some of them probably have been doing it a while. Some of them newer to the asset class. Curious, like where are you seeing capital come into the asset class from today? So historically, it was, a, like you've mentioned, it's a pretty niche investment type. Um, somebody had to have true understanding of the real estate industry and probably real estate debt specifically to make an allocation to real estate mm -hmm. debt. Today, we're seeing that interest come from your traditional real estate equity investors, and we're also seeing it from the private debt, private credit landscape, mm -hmm. and for two different reasons. Real estate equity is looking at some of the returns that they can achieve in the debt space, and they're saying, "Whoa, this looks really interesting." Mm -hmm. And we're having, we're struggling putting our equity dollars to work. There are opportunities for us in real estate debt mm -hmm. that can achieve similar returns. Right? Maybe that's and you're in a little an attractive bit place in the capital structure. Right? You well. might be a little bit higher in the capital yep. stack than than some of the some of the areas that that I was pointing out to pointing out earlier. Uh, but you can find really nice risk-adjusted returns from, from that equity perspective. Mm -hmm. With respect to private credit investors looking at the real estate debt space, they look at it as a diversifier. Mm -hmm. It's backed by a real asset. Mm -hmm. There's a long track record. And I think you were pointing at this out earlier too, private credit went through some of these shifts where it was dominated by banks or insurance companies. Real estate lending has been dominated by banks and insurance mm -hmm. companies and that slowly yep. started to unwind post the financial crisis and now even more so today. Yeah. So I think that shift will continue and we'll see investors across sort of the the investment world start to consider real estate debt. Yeah, it's really interesting to see the development of uh, the private credit asset class, broadly speaking, in, in the biggest umbrella terms you can use. Like a, a few years ago, we were talking about private credit, we'd be talking about corporate middle market direct lending, like pretty very specific area of the market. Now that market obviously due to some of the factors that we've talked about already has taken off and you know I don't know how the magnitude exactly of the growth, but it's something like a 1.5 or $1.6 trillion market today. So grown, grown massively. Um, but you have this scenario that I think you're kind of alluding to uh, that a lot of investors have gotten very comfortable with investing in private credit. And now we are seeing many different flavors of that. Um, you know, you can include everything from infrastructure debt to, you know, as different asset backed, private asset backed uh, securitizations and such. Um, so much, much more broad than, than just traditional corporate middle market lending. But I think to your point, increasingly investors are seeing real estate debt as part of that investment universe. And what's really interesting to me is that you are starting from a point where this is already a massive market. It's just one that's not traditionally been financed by institutional lenders. It's something like a $5 trillion market, but a lot of that obviously has been financed by, by banks. I mean, what do you see just, I mean, you, I'm sure you and the leadership team here at Barings are, you know, looking at that and expecting, uh, or, you know, trying to predict what the growth of the asset class could be over time. Um, what do you broadly think could happen here? Well, I certainly think that private lenders 
can increase their market share exponentially over the next few years. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I do think that that's a permanent shift in terms of supply demand mm-hmm. uh, for real estate loans. I think a lot of that permanency is going to be dependent on a lot of the factors that we're looking at today uh, with respect to asset performance, regulation, et cetera, uh, which will impact the traditional lenders in that landscape. It's hard to imagine a scenario where they don't curb some of that historical appetite. Mm-hmm. So there's only truly one source to fill that, and that is private capital. Public markets have always had some share of the market landscape, uh, but private private sources of capital will, will be will fill that void. Yeah, awesome. Um, okay, well, as we wrap up here, I wanted to just ask you, you know, thinking ahead for uh, the remainder of the year here, I'm curious to just to hear a little bit about what you're going to be watching, what you think some of the big trends are, um, what are you going to be keeping an eye on uh, as we move forward here? Well, an obvious one is the election, which here in the United States presidential election, which I think everybody- I haven't will, heard will, about that yeah, one yet. Yeah. Which okay. everybody will be yeah. focused okay, on. Okay, yeah. Um, but I think- to, to throw out one last statistic, so not to, not to be uh, an encyclopedia here. But, um, <laughs> there are about 1 million units, multifamily units, that will be delivered in 2024. Now, housing is almost a global crisis in terms of availability of housing mm-hmm. in, in many, many markets. Yep. But that is going to be a very interesting amount of inventory for us to absorb. Mm. And... If it was spread out evenly nationally, it's probably like, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's concentrated in, there are pockets of concentration of that development. So it'll be interesting to see what impact that has on valuations, asset performance, specifically in that asset class. So as much as I like multifamily as an asset Mm -hmm. class, Mm -hmm. again, we have to be very disciplined in our deployment approach, um, taking that macro level research lens and then the bottom up approach of boots on the ground and understanding mm-hmm. where that supply is coming in and how it's going to impact existing assets or new assets that we might want to lend on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's a great one to watch. All right, Nasir, I am going to give you the last word on this podcast. Uh, I want you just to think about uh, addressing um, any investors out there in real estate debt. Maybe they have uh allocations to the asset class today, maybe they're thinking about allocating to the asset class. Any kind of core messages you'd want to leave them with? I think I'd say that despite all the risks and uncertainties that are out there, this is still probably one of the best times to be deploying capital in real estate that that I've seen in my entire career. And that's spanning over 25 years. And you can probably go back another decade or so before you saw something as attractive as today. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's, That's a great one to leave it on. So... You heard it, folks. Uh, and this year's been operating in this asset class for a long time, and um, and uh, I, you know, I, that, so that I think that really um, uh, holds some weight um, in terms of the opportunities that you're seeing today. So, thank you for doing this. Always appreciate getting your um, insights into this market. It's a fascinating space to watch. I think it's going to be really, really interesting to see its growth in the years to come. And uh, I think. Uh, you and the team are right at the forefront of that. So um, really appreciate your time and uh, hope to do it again soon. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for listening or watching this episode of Streaming Income. If you'd like to stay up to date on our latest thoughts on asset classes ranging from high yield and private credit to real estate debt and equity, make sure to follow us and leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and more. And if you have specific feedback, you can email us at podcast at bearings.com. That's podcast at B-A-R-I-N-G-S.com. Thanks again for listening and see you next time.